good to be back. I don't think I've been here for almost a year, and so you may have forgotten that I tend to be long-winded. So uh, I'll try to keep it, um, I'm not going to say short, but I'll try to keep it contained. Is that a fair way to say it? So what I want to talk to you tonight about is something you're really, maybe a way I should say this is, I'm not going to tell you anything new tonight, but maybe I'll put it in a package. Maybe you'll hear it maybe in a, a new way, and it'll, it'll impact you in a, in a way it's never impacted you before. Maybe you'll put two dots together that you haven't connected before, and that's really what I'm going for. But I want to talk about the Bible as a whole. I want to talk about the whole thing. So we're going to start in Genesis and work all the way through. No, that's not what I mean. We're going to um, talk about what the Bible is, or more specifically, some characteristics about your Bible. So I do encourage you to grab one if you have one. If you have a phone, maybe that'll count as well. We are going to look at a few different passages this evening, and we're going to start in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Now, some of my Bible nerds in the room will know this passage already and can probably give me the first line, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verse 16. So before we dive into this one, I'm going to give you four characteristics of Scripture. So four things about the Bible that you need to hold on to. You, you need to embrace these. You need to believe these. You need to live in these four things. So we're, I'm going to say four things about God's Word, the Bible, the Scriptures. All three of those terms are the same. These four things, if you treasure them, if you trust them, then your Bible reading, your Bible growth, your Bible knowledge will all be impacted. So let's just dive into 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture. Now, the word all has a very fancy meaning. It means all of it, every bit. So if you open to the table of contents, how many books would you find listed in your table of contents? Well, all of them, but 66, okay? Now, granted, some of you, maybe if you have a Catholic Bible, there's, there's more, but we won't get into that. But your Bible ought to have 66 books in it. We'll see who the true nerds are. How many are in the Old Testament? 39. Somebody say that? That was a confident answer. Well, if you're quick at math, you already know how many in the New Testament, but how many are in the New? Oh, you aren't nearly as confident. You can walk out here as a nerd, okay? 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. That ought to add up to 66 books. How many of them are included in this passage of Scripture? All. Because all Scripture is God-breathed. My translation says all Scripture is breathed out by God. God. Now, there's a lot of human authors in the Bible. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. In fact, Jeremiah, or one of the later prophets, probably wrote some of the last portions because we even have a story about how Moses died. But lots of different authors wrote the scriptures. Matthew wrote Matthew. Who do you think wrote Mark? Who do you think wrote Luke? What about John? What about Timothy? Who wrote Timothy? Oh, that was good. Somebody, I was setting you up. All right, Timothy did not write. Um, Timothy, Paul did. But there's a lot of different human authors behind Scripture. But the reason it's Scripture is not because these authors were special. It's because these particular books have an author that's one step back. Not Luke, not Paul, not Matthew, not Moses. And who are we talking about? God. All Scripture is God-breathed. It came from him. And so here's the number one characteristic of Scripture. You need to always remember that Scripture has authority. Scripture has authority. Authority is a fancy word for it can tell you what to do. It can tell you what to think. It can tell you how to act. It can tell you what to believe. Now, what happens when we disagree with the Bible? <laughs> You're wrong. That's a very good answer. You're wrong. So what should you do when you find you disagree with Scripture? change your mind. <laughs> You're wrong. You need to change your mind. Scripture has authority. So we've made a, a, a step here, and I want to make sure you connect the, the, the gap. So God has authority. Would we agree on that? How much authority does God have? All of it. I like to tell people there's only two things. Really, I mean, we could really summarize everything that exists as being either one thing or the other thing. 
And if I say one of those things is God, what is the other thing? <laughs> Not God, okay. <laughs> Creation, right? So you have creator, and if you're not creator, you're part of what? Creation. So where would we put the earth? Creation. Where would we put angels? Creation. Where would we put Satan? Creation. All right, here's how authority works. One circle has authority, and the other circle doesn't. All right, it's not real difficult. Which circle has authority? Creation or creator or creation? Creator. How much authority does the creator have? All of it. Absolutely sovereign authority. He gets to make up the rules. He gets to tell us what to do. So why would we say the Bible has authority? Because he said it. So anything the creator says has the exact same level of authority that he does. Why? Because it's his word. It's what he has to say. So that statement that all scripture, every bit of it, all 66 books of that Bible come from God as the source, then they have God's authority. Now, we have this tendency to dismiss the authority of the Bible. Have you ever openly disagreed with scripture or just refused to obey it? We have a biblical example of someone who did this. The word of the Lord one time came to a prophet named Jonah. And he was told, I want you to go, Jonah, and preach to the Ninevites. You know this story, right? What did Jonah do? Did he rise up and go to Nineveh the next day? No, he went, got on a boat. What was he trying to do? He's running from the Lord. And that makes a lot of sense. He goes and gets on a boat. He gets out into the middle of the sea. And interesting, if you study the passage, it, he tells everybody he was running from Yahweh. They just didn't know Yahweh's name. They didn't know who Yahweh was. Who is Yahweh? Not just any God. What God? The God, the God who made everything. So they get out on the boat. The storm comes. You know the story. They end up casting lots. And a lot, that's kind of like rolling dice, right? We would say that's chance. But who was in control that day? God was. And the lot fell to who? Fell to Jonah. Lands on Jonah and they say, all right, Jonah, what's up? Tell us what's going on. He says, all right, I'm running from Yahweh, like I told you, and uh, he happens to be, you know, maybe the maker of the sea, where I'm at, and the wind, and all of the earth, and oh boy, this was a bad idea. You know how the story ends. He ends up in the belly of the well, and that's a good place to find repentance, and he finds some level of repentance, ends up back on the land, goes to Nineveh with some obedience. He preaches the gospel, or he preaches repentance to the people at Nineveh. Now, before the story started, would you say the Ninevites were better people or that Jonah was a better person? Just from a humanly perspective, who would you say was probably the better person? Jonah, right? He's a prophet. He's an Israelite, of course. He gets a direct word from God himself with God's authority. And what was his response? No, he runs. The Ninevites hear this message from just a prophet. Not directly from God, but just a prophet. And how do they respond? They repent. They totally repent, and God spares them. These unbelievers had a better respect of God's authority than Jonah did. That's why sometimes we need to remind ourselves that the Bible has God's authority, and we need to respect that authority. So when the word of the Lord comes to us, when we're studying, when we read, when we're growing, let's not be like Jonah and go get on the boat. Let's remember that he's the creator He's the one who has absolute sovereign authority. And anything he says, anything that's been written down here, carries that authority. And let us obey it. So God's word has authority. Let's keep going. Let's go now to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I'm going to kind of set up a doctrine and then go give you an example in Acts. But I want you to see the scripture. Romans chapter 10. And we're going to look at verse 17. So I want you to see a pattern, and this is everywhere in Scripture. In fact, it's everywhere in this room as well. People get saved after they have listened to or heard what? The Word. Or specifically, we might say the Gospel, but we mean the same thing. So we just see that here, biblically, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing. 
Now, what's our role in salvation? We don't do the works, right? What part do we play? That word. We, we faith. We trust. We listen to it and we respond in faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So the only way to have faith is to have heard the gospel, right? Here's, here's the thing about God's word that you need to know. God's word is necessary for salvation. You cannot be saved apart from God's word. Now, let's be clear. I'm not saying you have to, to know every single verse in this book in order to be saved. Because if that was the case, how many of us would, would make it to the gates? <laughs> not very many. In fact, actually, you don't have to know much of it at all to be saved. If we can go back to the thief on the cross, he didn't have a lot of access to the written word, but he knew about that much of the gospel. And what was his response? Faith. What about the Ninevites? They heard maybe even less of the gospel. And what was their response? Faith. But did they need to have it? Did they need to have something to respond to? Absolutely. God's word is necessary for our salvation. Let me just show you this test case scenario. Acts chapter 10. You may remember this story. The gospel after Jesus has ascended to heaven, is being preached primarily among one ethnic group. Only this one group of people are getting saved. And what group is that? Do you know? The Jews, the Hebrews, the Israelites. They're the only ones who are getting saved. Now, does the church always only consist of Jews? No, because what are virtually every one of us in this room is probably what? A Gentile, which biblically speaking just means non jew we're a different group. Well, at the beginning, it was only Jews. And then there was this interesting scenario where some Samaritans got saved. But that kind of made sense because they're half Jews. But let's look here at this man named Cornelius. This is Acts 10, verse 1. Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. Now, what ethnicity do you think Cornelius is if he's of the Italian cohort? He's Roman, which means he's a Gentile. So a devout man who feared God with all of his household, he gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. So just as a general description, when we say this is a good guy or a bad guy, this seems like a pretty good guy. In fact, if you think about church people you know, Cornelius might be a better example of a Christian than they are. We're going to find out he's not one yet. He doesn't know the gospel yet. He's heard of the God of the Old Testament, though, and he has respect and fear for that name, but he has a vision that he needs to go send for a man named Peter. You've heard of Peter, right? He's one of the what? He's one of the 12. In fact, he's Peter. He's the one who walked on water. He's the one who denied Jesus in that sad story, but then he's restored. He's a leader of the early church. So he sends for Peter. He sends some guys immediately, but meanwhile, Peter has a vision, and you might remember the vision. A blanket comes down, and there's something in the blanket. Do you remember what's in the blanket? Animals, what kind of animals? Unclean animals. And this comes down and says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, I'm not going to eat that. That's unclean. I don't eat unclean food. And it happens three times, and then three Gentiles knock on the door. What was the vision about? You need to go listen to these Gentiles, Peter. Listen to what they have to say. Long story, he ends up at Cornelius' house he gets there, and you would assume Peter knows exactly what he's supposed to do. They've basically provided a church service for him. He's gathered the whole town, his friends and family in a room, sets him up a podium, and Peter walks up and says, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. And they explain, well, Peter, um, we had a vision that you had some message for us to hear. And then Peter, it's, it's to us it's so obvious, Peter goes, oh, I'm supposed to share the gospel. And then he does. And guess what happens in that room? They get saved. The Holy Spirit comes down. and He didn't even have time to give an invitation. They respond. They're hearing the word of Christ and what happens in their hearts. Faith. And they get saved. Here's my point. These were God-fearing people. We would say they were fairly righteous people. Now, Paul would tell us there's none righteous, no, not one, and we know that, but they didn't get saved until the gospel came. This book is necessary. We need to know what this says because it's necessary for our salvation. So God's word has authority and God's word is necessary. Number three, God's word is sufficient. Do you use that word very often? Sufficient. Hebrews chapter one. God's word is sufficient. Maybe a, a simpler way to say it is God's word is enough. God's word is enough. I heard on the radio one time, 
actually quit listening to this particular radio station for like three years because of this comment. You ever watch a TV show and you get angry? You just don't want to listen to that anymore, a news station or some particular broadcast. So that's, this happened to me on a Christian radio station one time. They had this guest host on, or a guest speaker on the, the show, and they were giving this really fantastic story about how God had done something miraculous, which on its own account was, you know, it's a pretty interesting thing to talk about. It was God honoring, but then the, the host said, you know, sometimes the gospel is just not enough anymore, and we need things like this. And I'm just like, click. No, no, that's not how this works. The gospel is always enough. The Bible is always enough. The words of Christ are always enough. But let me show it to you. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So what's he pointing back to here? It's the Old Testament. God spoke through prophets. We have countless examples of this. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, so when did the last days begin? Back with Jesus. We've been in the last days for quite some time. But in these last days, he's spoken to us, instead of by prophets, by whom? By his son, by Jesus Christ, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So you have Moses, and then you have Jesus. Which one's a prophet? Trick question, yes. Which one's a better prophet? Jesus. Every time. Any prophet we put in over here, what about Samuel? Who's a better prophet between him and Jesus? Jesus. Doesn't matter. You see how this works? Hebrews is going to show this point over and over and over again. Jesus is better at all of this. Now, why is he a better prophet than all of these guys? He's God. He knows it. He's, in fact, verse 3 He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by his power. Jesus perfectly and fully and faithfully told us who God was. He's telling us who himself is. He's telling us about his father. He even told us about the helper who would come. Jesus is perfect in his presentation, perfect in his message. He's a perfect prophet. So... Could we ever expect anyone to do a better job than he did? So should we ever expect someone else to write another book of the Bible? No. Because Jesus, he wrote the New Testament. That's the the idea here is he came, he lived it out, and it was compiled by the apostles. And in the final book, we, we call it Revelation, which the Greek word there is apocalypse. Right? You've heard that word. And when you hear the word apocalypse, what does that make you think of immediately? End of the world, right? That's not what the world word means. You already know what the word means. It's, that's the name of it in Greek. The name of it in English is what? Revelation. You reveal. Who has been revealed in the last book? Jesus. Jesus is revealed. It's his revelation. We need nothing else because he's sufficient. He's enough. If we ever try to add to the Bible or, or try to go out and hear a new word from the Lord, We're saying Jesus wasn't sufficient. That's blasphemous. Jesus was enough. He is enough. God's word has authority. God's word is necessary. God's word is sufficient. And number four, this is the most hard to believe. God's word is understandable. God's word is understandable. And in doctrine, we call this clarity or clear. God's word is clear. You ever feel like that's not true? I've read passages of the Bible and go, uh, ain't nothing clear about this. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is God's word can be and is commonly understood. We can understand the message of the Bible. So I want to show you this. This is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4. This is one you should highlight, just a comfort verse for you. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 4. So Paul writing, and I love the Apostle Paul. This is in the middle of a run-on sentence, which, you know, if you ever have an English teacher get mad at you for run-on sentences, you should know there's some in the Bible, and that's inspired, and it's perfect. So a run-on sentence is a God-honoring thing. All right, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4. Paul says, when you read this, who's the you in that passage? It's us. So when you read this, what's the this in that passage? 
the Bible, the gospel, the word, the scriptures. So when you read this, my translation says you can perceive. Some of your translations use the word you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So if you read it, what does Paul promise can happen? You can understand it. Now, does that mean you get it on the first try? No, there, there's work involved. In fact, it's not a completely passive verse. What do you have to do? There's a prerequisite to that understanding. You have to do what to it? Read it. <laughs> so there's already some effort on your part. You have to put in some effort, but God promises. Paul made a specific promise to you as a believer. If you read this, you can understand it. In fact, I would go as far as to say God designed the Bible to be understandable. He designed it that way. Well, what do I mean? God could have spoken in a plethora of ways. He could have done it in so many different ways, but God spoke to us in human language. In fact, furthermore, he, he had it written down. So it could, you ever hear something and you forget it? That's why I love text messages. Now, sometimes they can be subject to misinterpretation. Anybody have that? But when it's written down, if you text me an address, I don't have to remember the address or I don't have to remember that phone number because it's written down. And I can go back and double check myself. There's kind of a, uh, did anybody keep a notebook or a journal for that purpose? You write things down to, to kind of like it records it in history. That's how God chose to speak to us was in a way that we could see in a way that we could read, that we could understand. We think about reading levels. There's parts of Scripture that are incredibly simple. There's parts of Scripture that are more academic. And God's designed this word to help explain things to us at different levels, at different times, at different seasons. God wants you to understand his word, and he's designed it to be understandable. And even on top of that, it's not just that it's designed to be understandable. It's alive, and it wants to be understood. Have you ever been communicating something and you felt like the people you were talking to just didn't understand? Now, you have a few options there. You could get angry and you could storm off. What's the other option? You could explain it another way. Try harder. Use a different illustration. Think about that. Do you think the Holy Spirit's ever going to have a bad attitude about your ability to understand the word. God, this person is so stupid. I, no, that's not what the Holy Spirit does. What do you think his response is? I'll get in there. I'll get in there. In fact, the Bible tells us, Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible, it's living and it's active. And it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces down to the marrow, but more than that, it pierces down to the soul and to the spirit. Have you ever felt like you were too hard-headed? to get what this was saying. Well, it doesn't matter how hard your head is when you have a, a scalpel that sharp. It can get in there, and it can cut you open, fillet you before the Lord, and he can do the surgery that he needs to do. It's designed to be understood. So dive in, try, and it's a promise in God's word. You can understand it. It's absolutely Possible. So let me end with this. I want to give you six ways to take advantage of that. If you want to take notes and write these down, I know you might not remember all six of them, but six ways to take advantage of God's gift of the word. Number one, this one's super simple. You should already be doing this one and know this one, is you should read it, okay? You have to read the Bible or this is not going to work. Now let me say something maybe a little more controversial. If you have a quiet time, and your primary way of reading the Bible is you read like a chapter a day. That might be why you don't understand it. I'm going to discourage you from just reading a chapter a day. Now, studying the Bible, that's a good practice. But does anybody ever pull out a movie and watch five minutes at a time? I'm going to watch five minutes of this movie today. I'm going to hit pause. I'm going to watch five minutes of this movie tomorrow and hit pause. Then five more minutes the next. Anybody ever watch the movie that way? In fact, I've grown up in a, kind of a different generation than, than many of you. I, I can use Netflix and watch something. And what does Netflix not have that normal television does? Commercials. 
I get to where I watch TV on a normal television now, and it goes to a commercial break. By the time we get back to the television show, I don't even know what we're watching anymore. My mind is gone. Well, it's because we aren't designed to work like that, to have just little snippets of the story. We do as much of it as we can at a time. We, we need to dedicate larger portions of time to read the Bible. You can sit down and read all of one of Paul's letters. There's no reason not to read the whole book of Ephesians at once. It's only 155 verses. It'd take you 10 minutes. So read the whole book. Don't read just a chapter. Read larger sections. Number two, study. This is where you stop and you ask questions. What's going on in this passage? Why did Paul say this? Why did Jesus do this? You're connecting the dots, and that needs to happen. You spend time doing the word that way. Number three, memorize. Hide God's word in your heart, and it will change you will transform you. And second to this, it's almost like a different way of looking at the same one, is meditate on Scripture. In fact, it's hard to memorize without meditation. But meditating is where you, that's where you get to the small verse. And you just look at that one verse over and over, and you think about how does this verse work in my life, thinking about the fact that we should store up our treasures in heaven. There's no Rust or moth that's going to destroy there. But the stuff we have here gets destroyed and you meditate on that and you think about that. It changes you. It changes your perspective. It changes your worldview. Number four, listen to other people teaching the word. So like this, hear it, pay attention. I'm amazed sometimes at how many people will come to church and they watch, go to Facebook instead. You're having an opportunity to hear the word of God taught and explained just enjoy that experience. It's like watching a movie. Just see how it's all put together. You don't have to understand everything that's said or remember everything that's said. Just have the experience. Listen to God's word. And then number, number six, this is a very important one. Teach the word. You got to share it with others. You'll find that when you share something with someone else, it increases your own understanding. It increases your desire to understand. If you do these six things... These are called, in theology, they're called the means of grace. Now, we don't mean they're the means of salvation. But if you're saved, you know that you can grow in grace, right? You, can, you, you have all the grace at your disposal. You're completely saved, but, but you can grow in grace. You can feel grace more at different times. Well, how can you grow in grace? You have to have just ordinary means, we, I know as a youth pastor, I always, I kind of loved youth camp, but I hated youth camp because the students always came back on fire for the Lord. They had this extraordinary experience with Jesus during youth camp, and then school starts, and what happens? They're right back down to what it was. We can't rely on extraordinary things. We have to rely on the ordinary things, which is reading your Bible, studying your Bible, memorizing your Bible, meditating on your Bible, listening to the Bible taught and teaching it yourself. If these things are happening over and over and over and over again in your life, then God's grace is going to be working and raining down on you, and it will not return void. So trust in it. We need to remind ourselves of this sometimes. I'm going to hand it over to Mitch now, and uh, I would close this out in prayer, but I think we're fixing to pray. So, yeah. so that makes sense. Thank you, brother. <laughs> If you appreciate Brian sharing the word of God with us, yeah, amen.